The Return of the Indian by Lynn Reed Banks, Chapter 18, Algonquin. There was an air of fear about the village. As twilight fell, the villagers seemed to be preparing to decamp. Such men as were left, mainly old, plus some wounded or unfit ones, were giving orders, and the women were running here and there, packing things into bundles. Others came with buckets of water and put out the few cooking fires that were burning, removed the pots and rounded up the children. A few dogs were dashing about, barking excitedly, sensing something in the hurrying and the anxious voices. Omri watched all this in growing alarm. The minutes were ticking by, being apparently nothing more than a picture on the side of a teepee. He couldn't see how he could be in danger himself, but he was so desperately worried about Bright Star's boon and the baby. After a while, one of the old women came around the teepee into Omri's sight. She was hobbling along as fast as she could, gazing up at the teepee with gaping mouth as if it had dropped from nowhere, as in a way it had. She bent the flap and called, and called. Bright Stars answered. The old woman hobbled away again, her white hair growing, glowing in the deep twilight. The tall pines around the camp now stood out black against the darkening sky. Omri heard Bright Stars in the teepee say to Boone, Leave village now. What's that? Leave for where? Hide in wood. There was a pause, then she said doubtfully, Boone, come? No, I can't. Why, no, you're not safe. They're not safe, not for me. I don't fit in, gal, you know that. Bright Stars said no more. There was a pause, then the teepee flap opened, and she came out with her baby, wrapped up in some hide torn from her skirt. She turned in the opening. There was a very soft look in her eyes as she looked, presumably, at Boone, standing out of Omri's sight inside. Then she hurried away, mingling with the knot of other Indians at the center of the village. Soon they were forming into a rough procession. It was almost too dark to see now, but Omri could just make them out as they silently made their way out of the circle of ruined and half-burnt buildings. Even the dogs were quiet now as they trailed along after the villagers. One of them, lingering, passed the teepee. He paused to leave his mark against the side of it, and for a moment he looked up, straight at Omri. His lips drew back over teeth which shone white in the darkness, and he whined uneasily. The hair of his back stood up straight. Then he tucked his long tail between his legs and shot off after the others. Soon the last rustles and murmurs subsided, and there was a deep silence, broken only by the call of a single owl. Bird or a signal? Omri had never known real fear. All he could compare this with was waking up was walking up Hobble Road and knowing that he had to pass the skinheads who were waiting for him. That seemed to him now like nothing at all. What was the worst they could do to him, after all? A black eye, a few bruises? This was in another category of fear altogether. Yes, what was he afraid of? Nothing could happen to him. Any second now, Patrick would turn the key in the lock of the chest and recall him to his body, to normality, to the utter blissful safety of his own life which he had never thought about before, far less appreciated. So, what was this icy feeling which could only be terror? Perhaps it was for Boone. Boone was behind him in the teepee, no longer a tiny figure, but a full-sized man, out of his place, out of his time. Visible, solid, vulnerable, and quite alone. How lonely could you be? Omri could hardly imagine how Boone must be feeling as he waited in the teepee for some unknown thing to happen. And suddenly it did. It began with another hoot from the owl. Then Omri saw a swift movement to one side of him, close to the edge of the clearing, then again on the other side. Then a man's figure crouched low, scurried past him, and abruptly the whole clearing seemed to be full of moving men. They were not Frenchmen, of course. They were Indians, little bear's men, returning to defend the place. Omri strained to see them. All he could make out was glimpses of leggings, of a head feather, the flash of an axe head catching the starlight. Then he saw that several men were raking wood from the cooking fires into one heap at the center of the ring of longhouses. Shadows began to spread from a light source in the midst of the of the men. Suddenly, a flame leapt high, and another. The fire had been lit, and at once Omri could see. These weren't little bear's men. Their clothes were different. Their heads were shaved. Their headdresses, even their movements, were alien. Their faces, too. Their faces! They were wild, distorted, terrifying masks of hatred and rage. They were Algonquins, come to sack the village. 
In the light of the central fire they ran to and fro, dozens of them, scores. It took only moments to find out that they had been outwitted, that the village was empty and there was nothing to steal, no women to carry off. Their anger burst out in howls and yelps. Through this outburst Omri heard a smothered groan below him. Boon! He must be peering out at the awful scene. Now the Indians were dipping branches into the big fire to make torches. They were dancing and shouting and leaping. Several of them were running to the few unburnt longhouses, and suddenly Omri knew. He knew what he had feared. They were going to burn the teepee, and he was part of it. The teepee was on the edge of the clearing. There were other things to set the fire first, to, to set on fire first. But they would get to him. They were coming closer, their howls fiercer than torches. Their howls fiercer, their torches swirling in clouds of smoke above their half-naked heads. Omri began screaming silently, Patrick! Patrick! Do it now! Turn the key! Bring me home! Save me! He saw an Indian making straight for him. His face in the torchlight was twisted with fury. For a second, Omri saw under the shaven scalp decorated with a single scalp lock the mindless, destructive face of a skinhead just before he lashed out. The torch went back with the man's right arm. There was a split second's pause, and then he came hurtling through the air and stuck and struck the panel of hide just beside Omri. It slithered down to the ground and lay there, its flame chewing the bottom edge. The Algonquin licked his lips, snarling like a dog, and ran back to the central fire. Omri had not realized he could smell as well as see and hear. Now he smelt the smoke, the stench of burning hide. It was dry and it caught quickly. In helpless horror, Omri watched the burnt area growing up around him like the letter A edged with, fl with flame. He hardly noticed another Indian approaching him from the other side with another blazing brand until suddenly, out of the daze of fear he had fallen into, Omri heard a loud bang. The Indian left the ground briefly. His fingers jerked open. The torch fell. Then the man did the same. Then the man did the same, dropped like a stone and lay motionless on his back while the branch burnt harmlessly beside him. All the others stopped dead, their grim faces turned toward the teepee. The shot had come from below. Omri saw the tip of a revolver barrel poking out of the slit in the hide just beneath him. And as the whole pack of Algonquins began to run, howling and yelling toward the teepee, their monstrous shadows sliding along the ground ahead of them, more shots rang out, and two, then three more Indians fell. The others hesitated, then scattered. The fire burnt clear in the center, unattended. The fire that was eating the teepee burnt too. Beside him, Omri could hear and even feel burn, and even feel Boone frantically beating at the licking flames with something. His hat, perhaps, and cursing, but it was useless. The fire was spreading. Get out, Boone! Run, Boone! Run into the forest! Save yourself! Smoke flowed past the painted animal Omri was inhabiting and blinded him. And that is the end of chapter 18.